Thank you all for coming to this final plenary discussion of the conference. My name is Lee Edwards. I'm a professor of strategic communications and public engagement here in the Department of Media and Communication, um, and I'll be chairing the discussion today. So on behalf of the department, we hope that you've all enjoyed the last two days and had a really stimulating and enlightening, engaging journey through different ways of thinking about media pasts and presents, and of course, media futures. And of, of course, I've gathered lots of ideas from presentations and conversations that we hope will inspire your work uh, after you leave here. For, the, for us as the department, it's been a really fantastic anniversary celebration, bringing together old friends from the last 20 years and making new ones that we hope will last for the next 20 years. And I'm really pleased that for our last panel, the inspiration will continue with our three speakers who come together, um, who bring together rather some of the most interesting and inspiring work in the field today. Um, so our first panelist is AJ Christian. AJ is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northwestern University in the United States. His research focuses on the political economy of legacy and new media, cultural studies, and community-based research. He published his first book, Open TV, Innovation Beyond Hollywood and the Rise of Web Television, with NYU Press in 2018. And he's currently writing his second book, Rep Reparative Media, Cultivating Stories and Platforms to Heal Our Culture, and that's with MIT Press. That book explores how to repair systemic harm and discrimination in the media and in technology and research. His scholarship has been published in numerous academic journals, including the International Journal of Communication, Television and New Media, Social Media and Society, the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, among other journals and edited collections. Our second panelist is Sonia Livingstone, who's Professor of Social Psychology in the Department of Media and Communications here at the LSE. She's published numerous books and articles across a panoply of subjects in the media and communications field, including her latest one, Parenting for a Digital Future, How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Lives. She directs the Digital Futures Commission with Five Rights Foundation and Global Kids Online with UNICEF, and also works on a series of European Commission and UK RI funded projects concerned with children's opportunities, risks and rights in a digital world. Since founding the 33-country EU Kids Online Network, Sonia has advised the UK Government, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Council of Europe, the OECD, the ITU and UNICEF on children's internet safety and rights in the digital environment. And our third panellist is Silvio Weisbord. Silvio is Professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University in the United States. He's the author and editor of numerous books and articles on journalism, politics, media, and communication for social change. His latest books are Public Scholarship in Communication Studies, co-edited with T.J. Billard with the University of Illinois Press, that's forthcoming, and The Routledge Com Companion to Media, Disinformation, and Populism, co-edited with Howard Tumber. He served as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Communication and the International Journal of Press Politics, and he's currently president-elect and fellow of the International Communication Association. Please join me in welcoming all our panelists. So we're going to structure the discussion today around four questions. Um, what, we're going to start off with uh, what questions have shaped your thinking about media futures and we'll go from there into various explorations of media futures um, as they might emerge in our conversation. We're going to be talking for around 45 minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions before we bring things to, to a conclusion. And with that, I'd like to invite AJ to respond first to that, quest, that opening question of what questions have shaped your thinking then about media futures? Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here at LSC on this 20th anniversary. Um, please forgive me, I woke up at 4 a.m. today. I'm horribly jet lagged, so I hope I can actually answer this question. Um, I've always been interested in how culture and technology shape the dynamics of power in media and creative industries. My primary focus has been on the what we call television, both legacy television on broadcast and cable in the United States, and also online video. A lot of the online video that we watch, whether it's TikTok or YouTube, I would call new forms of television. Um, and I've been interested in how people make these objects, both within industrial contexts and outside of them, and particularly outside of them, because we know industries and corporations are historically discriminatory. How do people who have been excluded from these industries utilize new technologies to tell their stories? Um, my first book was really a study of independent television creators 
who are kind of marginal creators in creator culture. A lot of creator culture is like people who put their face in front of the camera, right? And I was really interested in people who wrote scripts and hired cinematographers and editors, really complex forms of production that are very expensive. Um, and so almost irrational to like do that for online distribution where you're not gonna make money from it. Um, so when people do things that appear irrational, I'm very interested in that. And so I um, at, as, sort of interviewed a lot of these people and a lot of them were actually trying to break into Hollywood is what I found. And that book was really about how the internet kind of both showed Hollywood the way to cater to us via streaming and also kind of disrupted the norms and practices of how that industry develops its content. Um, and so in my current project, after doing all those interviews, I realized that people um, need a lot of support, that these platforms, YouTube, were not supporting these creators. And so I created my own platform um, called OTV Open Television in deep collaboration and solidarity with um, people of all kinds of intersectionalities. The platform is now led by black trans um, and non-binary women identified people. Um, and so I can talk a more about how that is my vision for Media Futures, right? A, a future where um, no matter how you identify, uh, you have power to tell your story, you have power to reach your communities, you have power to have a sustainable living wage, right? Um, and you don't have to go through corporations to um, participate in culture. Sonia, any thoughts? Um, <laughs> yes, I'm trying to remember the question now. Um, so um, I was going to begin with a, an aside, which is um, I realized during the last couple of days that my first job um, was uh, pretending to be Roger Silverstone for a year at <laughs> Brunel when he was free to go and do his research. And I went and um, covered for him. And I remember him saying then and after, um, social scientists, we uh, know something about the present and something about the past, but we really are rubbish at the future. Um, and so that's, but then I see that I keep titling the future like in my book and in my current um, project. So I think for me, um, and I, I would trace this back actually to working with, with Roger on um, early projects on how people understand the arrival of digital technologies, wave after wave of innovation in their lives, and he was developing the domestication framework at that time. Um, and so he was focusing, and I have, um, I think very often since, focused on um, how people think of themselves in terms of the future, and how they, um, they do, why they do, orient themselves towards the future, and how media technologies, media innovation symbolize the future for people. So, so in you know, parenting for a digital future, I was really asking people about now, and now is what they can talk about um, much more than, than the future, but I realized that they were always talking, about, in a way they were using now to think through the future, um, thinking about uh, how they engage with technologies, um, weighted, the, the, the meaning of those actions, very much weighted both by where they had come from and the story of change that they were kind of living through, but also um, uh, how, they, how they saw every action now having this kind of portentous significance for their, you know, if I give my child a smartphone now, will they grow up to be a sentient person? If I you know, let them watch this or that program, will, they, um, will it ruin their future paths or set them off on particular directions? And then, so that, that kind of led me to lots of thinking about, you know, we can, People struggle to think about that future, and and the um, so um, as some will know, I've um, often worked with the idea of mediation, which I can also trace um, to to Roger Silverstone. Um, so there's this kind of double thing, and people are using technologies to think about the future, um, but the way in which they think about the future is also mediated by all kinds of science fiction imagery and um, mediated imagery about what the future might mean. Yeah, yeah, those complexity questions I think are really interesting. We might come back to them. Silvio. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I have not written about media futures per se, except for uh, a recent paper in which I do a critical review of the whole debate about uh, the future of, of, of journalism. So when I was invited and I was sort of asked this question, I sort of went back to what I've done and see that where where it is, and I mean, the, the, the first point is that when we're talking about media futures, we need to unpack it because we're talking about media's industry, media's technology, media's uh, cultural form, 
media's audiences, media's media professions. So uh, the rubric of media futures, you know, includes all kinds of things that are very different, although connected. Um, second is that I think thinking about media futures to me is more the apprehension or the skepticism about conventional sort of three um, narratives uh, or three approaches to the study of media futures. Uh, one is futurism, right, which is very popular in certain sort of industries adjacent to media industries particularly. Second one is techno-solutionism. And the third one is uh, techno-determinism, the idea that, I mean, the focus is on, on technology in all three, on media technologies or other technologies. And I think what I try to do implicitly, more than explicitly, is caution about making media the center and instead studying social for the way social forces shape uh, media futures. And by the plural, I mean the media technology, the forms, the practices, et cetera. So rather than putting media as technology um, at the center. So, and this is what I think that my sort of comparative uh, perspective approach sort of taught me that actually it, it, it all depends how social forces harness what are the different futures for the media. And I will not talk about the potential. The potential is basically how it is actually transmitted, um, crystallized in the way that different institutions actually use the media for, for what. Um, and related to this is that when we talk about social forces, the idea that not all social actors have similar power to shape the futures of, of media, whether it's media professions or media industries. And, and I think that is a sort of a very long tradition in media studies to actually figure this out, how sort of power shapes the way that media eventually turns out to be and whether or not, if you look at the media evolution across societies, what are the differences that could be explained because of different balance of social forces or different weight of different social forces. I will say those are the sort of the main sort of approaches to to the question. Mm. I mean, these are really interesting ideas, I think, and and, and um, you bring up the idea of power, you brought up the idea of complexity, but you are both talking about uh, agentic individuals using media to create power in their own spaces, in their own social context, I suppose. So I don't know if you want to kind of come back on this idea of power mm. and, and how that notion of power as a structuring and structured force uh, in the media context might you know, shape your own thoughts as well. Yeah, I think Silvio is exactly right that it's a very, when we look at power, it's a very complex thing, right? Um, when I think about media futures, when I you know, speak to an artist and they're asking me, because like you say, people do try to project out the future because they want to know, will I be able to survive it, right? Um, and when they ask me, what should I do? What's the future holding? I actually largely look to the dynamics of regulation, the dynamics of um, economics. Um, technology comes into play, but actually it is oftentimes these other forces that are both social forces and also institutional forces that shape media futures. Um, and I'm very skeptical as, as to the power of any individual or even a small collective to actually shape that um, in real meaningful ways. Um, and so really what I do in my work is look at how those larger structural dynamics inform the context in which people can act and then really find what are the best ways when we have these moments where we can do something, right? We can maybe shape and influence the field even though we kind of know we're going to fail, right? I, when, I, um, when I started my project, my community-based project, I was deeply inspired by a lot of queer studies scho scholarship that looks at queer notions of the future that are inevitably tied up with notions of failure, right? That you will fail. There, there's something about queerness that knows the inevitability of failure but tries anyway, and in that trying, creates something new that sustains life for a moment, right? Um, and I think. The, uh, that's a lot of what I've been doing in my work, and that's a lot of what the people around me do every day. So you promised me you were going to talk about something more optimistic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not go straight to the inevitability of failure. I mean, okay, so I mean, so uh, to, be, to be very grounded about it, you know, I started this project and I was like, I'm going to fail at this. I'm going to create a queer TV network. That cannot exist, like, for very long. Um, and then something happened that was weird where it actually seemed to be useful to people. Um, and so, 
every year I was like, how do I end this project? And every year more and more people were coming to me like, hey, can you help me make a, t a TV show? Can you help me distribute the show? Can you help me finance the show? And I got kind of overwhelmed and it became kind of a really tense thing with my tenure situation because I was helping all these artists and I wasn't publishing. Um, and I got tenure, it's fine. Um, but, you know, what was very strange was I actually didn't plan for success and that became a problem um, because when, like, I had all these people looking at me like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I didn't really have a plan. I was very lucky that I managed to get in front of the right program officers at the right foundations. And you know, since 2019, the platform's raised like $3 million, and it's got funding through 2026. And they have a fellowship, and you, they'll pay you $10,000 to make your story or whatever. Um, so that's a, ho that's a hopeful thing. There's an intersectional queer TV network out there that you, know, you, can, you can subscribe to it. We are on all platforms. Roku, Apple, Android, $4 a month, support queer TV. Um, <laughs> But you know, I just had a board meeting last week with the executive director and, and they're just like, okay, so what's the plan for after 2026? So we have a plan to like potentially fold it and turn it into something new, right? Like we have to keep moving with these currents. Is it, are we gonna have to go to blockchain, right? Is, are the Hollywood stream companies gonna conglomerate and so there's gonna be more demand for alternative stuff? Or will they completely blanket the field with franchise properties and make us completely irrelevant, right? Like there's, everything is so very precarious. But I do think that when we think about progressive media futures, right? It's the engaging of the process and the doing the best we can in the moment. That's really all we can do, mm -hmm. but doing it in solidarity, right? Like we're not doing it alone, we're doing it together um, and we're struggling together. Mm -hmm. So still going back to the social context, I, I guess in that case, if that's your starting point for spotting these spaces of precarity and possibility at the same time, that's where mm -hmm. that power kind of comes from. I mean, lots of people I interviewed do feel they're doing it on their own. I mean, maybe that was one of the things that I take away from parents, um, interviewing parents about the, quote, digital future, um, that they often felt very isolated, like they are facing the challenges and they have got to get it crucially right for their child in 10 years or 20 years. I often began the interviews by saying, you know, tell me about the year um, 2040. And then that would like kill the interview because <laughs> <laughs> nobody. But I say, but that's you know that's when your child grows up, you know you are you, you and, and of course they are making the plan. They have arranged their home. They are investing their resources. They are um, getting you know the kid into coding club or the right kind of school that they whatever they can manage for that eventuality that they precisely can't see. And they often talk in a way that does feel very isolated. And, you know, Alicia um, Blum Ross and I, in interviewing them, were very struck by the lack of solidarity and the, the, the search for it, but also, you know, in a, in a risk society, and, and the risk society framework is one that I would, would turn to, um, you know, it is precisely the point that people feel competitive with each other and divided from each other. So I can think of lots of, you know, and I heard in the work a lot of very micro actions in which people are trying to make the present, trying to make the future through their actions in the present. But whether that, you know, whether that has any grand um, purchase in the bigger scheme of things, that, you know, I, I, I can't say, they can't say, but I, I kind of wanted to record the the effort that they were making, the, the, the parent that puts their child in a code club because they're told coding is the new Latin. You know, the parent who is teaching their child to cook because they're so scared of the metaverse, they want their child to know about something material when they've gone off to live in the virtual. Um, you know, there were all kinds of um, ways of trying to make that future for individuals. Um, I don't want to... Um, you know, I don't either want to big it up or to kind of denigrate it as something that is so micro and so small that it doesn't matter because actually, I think it, you know, I'm always, I, I, I hear the, the big stories about power and pessimism um, and then people side up to me and say, yeah, but what is the right, you know, number of hours for my job? And I think, <laughs> yeah, people do really, they are, they are worried about the, these, these kind of everyday micro decisions as well and they just it's that kind of act of faith that it will bring about some something better a little bit better well you're, you're both talking about variety the variety of things that people mm. do and sylvia at the beginning you you said you know media futures is this panoply of possible possible things really i mm -hmm. don't know if you want to well I, I mean i think that when you're talking about this there is sort of a gravitational pull and we know 
you know, media historians have documented this extensively, that the repetition or the similarities of, you know, sort of the debate about early media development, about what the media is about, right? That is sort of consistent themes, is especially by industry around, you know, sort of the last, let's say, 150 years or so, in the development of new media. So we have this iteration of, of that. And what is typically missing is the social force part. So you can you can go wrong if you were to sort of revisit what the speculations are, particularly by industry or by advocates of different quote unquote new technologies for whatever sort of bright future ahead or you know or pessimistic future ahead, by looking at sort of how te how technologies, how media, how industries eventually turn out to be in ways that is not out of the blue, right? But there is a question of legacies and path dependency and you know policy traditions and you know economics that eventually always battle and try to shape the way that the media develop. But it's never just about the technology. Uh, that is about something much more sort of at least by sociological institutional bias, that is about the way that institutions debate that. But still you have sort of every time and the ongoing debate now about generative AI is another iteration, whether or not it's the pessimist argument or the optimist argument, as if society doesn't matter. And it's just remarkable how invisible that tends to be unless, until someone said, wait, wait a minute, you're forgetting something that we learned time and time again from different rounds and ways of technological innovation that is not only about the technology, even though of course it matters, but it's about how societies decide to organize and use different technology. So that to me is an argument that is always necessary, no matter how many times has been made, because it is kind of, I don't know, forgetfulness or ignorance. And that it seems to me that has to do with sort of people in power, because they have the autonomy, they have the luxury to plan ahead and to think that they can manage, you know, by themselves, imposing their will on everybody else, what this technology will be about. And they have the capacity to sort of dominate that discourse, especially in the very early stages of the development about where we're headed with this new technology. And then realizing that, of course, it's more chaotic, it's more messy, no matter where things look good or look bad. So that to me is always something that I sort of remind myself as a way to think about the next thing. I can give more specific examples, but that as a, as a theoretical approach to me is, is still necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which kind of brings us nicely, this idea of iterative rediscoveries over time brings us nicely to the second question. So the second question is, uh, what is the place of time and temporality in your work and how does that shape your idea of media futures? And perhaps we could start with Sonia on this one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I um, so there are lots of theorizations of um, time and temporality. Um, and uh, perhaps I draw on different ideas at, 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 for different projects. Um, most obvious to me, in a way, um, thinking about um, people's lives and the stories they tell and the stories they are told about media, um, is something um, I guess I would call biographical time. Um, and um, I will hazard the idea that people can more or less imagine the, cent the century of which they are in the middle. Um, so I find in interviews, for example, I can ask people to go back to telling me about their grandparents, but before that is history. And they can kind of think forward to their grandchildren, but after that is science fiction or some dystopian um, mediated um, imaginary. But within that kind of space of a century, people can kind of, um, they can narrativize in ways that make sense for them, that they can construct their identity within that, and they have a, um, a biographical unfolding that makes sense, that, that um, not only makes sense for them, but is shared among um, families, debated um, with friends um, and others, um, and kind of gives meaning to the sense they have of making um, agentic uh, choices. But it's, you know, it's, it's a time span. And the curious thing is that we're all at different points. You know, our centuries are all a bit different. So there are generational differences. So I might say something about, you know, the idea of generational time. Mm 
um, is also broad, and that maps onto, I mean, as um, you're in Berlin, who's sitting right in my eye line, has, has powerfully argued, you know, that maps onto, me media has its own kind of trajectory and becomes new and old and legacy and so forth at different points, but people's lives map onto that in different ways, and I think so when they're having, so a lot of the conversations between generations are kind of misunderstandings and competing accounts of where we've come from and perhaps where we're going and what matters now because we're at these different points. And generational tensions, I think, are actually becoming quite... They're kind of moving more to the forefront of um, areas of conflict and even talk about generational justice. So in my work, I mean, I have basically try to focus on the presentism with some sensitivity to the past rather than talking about the future for, for a variety of reasons. And to me, it's always interesting what I mentioned earlier in terms of path dependency and historical legacies, how sort of any innovation, media innovation, at least in studies that I've done on, on journalism practice, news industries, media policy, in some ways how new ideas or new technologies are absorbed within existing sort of patterns and and dynamics and something is something interesting happens because it's not exactly what was predicted especially if you look in the global south for a variety of reasons mm -hmm. uh, access to technology access to resources politics i mean all kinds of variables uh, it never quite go the way that especially in the global north sort of this prediction or these very futuristic notions about what technology or certain practices practice can be i don't know investigative journalism or data journalism, it never works out exactly the same way. To the point that you can say, well, I will be surprised if it works exactly the same way because of all these sort of social forces that continue to shape things. The interesting point is when, um, when it doesn't work that way, when there is a, you know, the path dependency doesn't explain exactly what is happening right now. And that is a moment of inflection, a turning point. Um, and that becomes interesting because it is not what you have, could have predicted. And that to me is sort of a very interesting, because it raises the question about why, why not? Um, and I would say that is a way of sort of trying to bring together sort of the way we study about sort of the past, the present, and the future in the way that we develop an analytical approach by asking questions rather than the more simplistic, naive, and actually not very interesting or say, you know, spec, just speculating about the future, right? Uh, especially when you know people don't have the time or you know the, the resources to actually manage the future. I mean, those who speculate about that assume that you have significant resources and power, authority, to actually shape the future in ways that you assume that cannot be impeded by by others, right? Uh, and reality, you know, unfortunately, is much more complicated than that. Um, I would say that's the way that temporarily enters, that is not about a distinct sort of division of time. But it all depends on the kind of question that you're asking, whether it's a theoretical or empirical question. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because what you, what you point out there is that actually predicting a future comes from a position of privilege where you think you can because right. you have the tools to do that. Uh, which is kind of interesting in and of itself that we're actually asking the question here, you know, um, AJ. Well, you know, I really, yeah, I want to respond to that because I, and, and speak from my privileged Global North perspective, which I have, um, and I just have to own, that I, um, I'll speak, I'll answer this in a very grounded way. I did actually think I could predict the future 10 years ago. Um, and, and I did, actually. Um, <laughs> because, because, you know, Capitalism and colonialism is just very predictable. Um, and if you study something very specifically, like media industries, as it relates to intersectionality, which is just such a specific intersection, and you read enough scholarship, and that's why research is so important, it do, the past does give you a path to the future. So, you know, let's, let's, let me explain what I'm talking about. So in 2012, you know, I got to Northwestern, just got, got my PhD. And I finally had a startup budget. I was like, oh my god, I have a budget. So what can I do? I want to do something. I don't want to work, work with communities. I want to be useful to people, right? Um, that was my most important thing. I want to do something of use. And so I was thinking, like, what do I do? What do I do? And that was the year that Netflix ordered House of Cards, their first TV show. They spent $100 million on this show. 
for two seasons. And the next show was Orange is the New Black, which was, like, all I'm seeing on my timeline is Orange is the New Black is, like, it's such a hit. Everyone's talking about it. Most streamed show on Netflix, right? This is a show about largely queer women of color. Probably the first TV show in U.S. history about queer women of color, even though it's really about, like, a cis white woman. There's, it's complicated. But there's a lot of queer women of color in that show. Um, so I'm like, this is interesting. This reminds me of historical trends. So when you go back to the 1990s in the US, there's this surge of black television, right? And it's all because cable is the new media technology. And cable, because you have to pay for it, is actually siphoning white viewers away from broadcast television. So broadcast TV goes to the black TV audience. I'm like, OK, that's interesting. That kind of reminds me of the 70s, when we start getting the first ever black TV shows, and also black exploitation, right? Because the studio system had collapsed after the Paramount Consent Decrees 1948, right? By 1970s, they're like, where is the audience? They don't know, so they go to black people, right? This is an historical trend, right? They use black people as this expendable surplus resource to shore up industrial bottom lines before they can figure out the new technology and get white people onboarded, and then they leave us behind. That's like the pattern historically. So I'm like, OK, here it is with streaming. It's coming. Black people are going to be in in the 2010s. Um, and also, I looked at the internet, and because the internet is peer-to-peer, -peer, I theorized that potentially more complex identities might trend in this period. Queer people of color, right? Trans people of color. So that's why I started OTV. I was like, let me do intersectionality. I can actually support these people who've been historically marginalized in getting into the system when the door is open, because I know in 10 years it's going to be closed. It's 2023. The door is closing. Like, have you read Variety? Like, I was just in Hollywood. I'm hearing from executives, literally, black is out. <laughs> black is out. Like, we've been here. We're not going anywhere, right? <laughs> but black is out. Um, and you know, I did actually help a lot of artists enter this system. Like, in the five years that I ran OTV, we sent probably over two dozen people to work with Hulu, HBO, Netflix. We sold a show to HBO. We sold a show to Hulu. There's more shows that have been sold. Actually, today, um, in theaters in the United States is a film called The Blackening, which is the first kind of wide release from a writer that came through OTV. It's brilliant. You should definitely watch it. It's a spoof on the horror genre. So I, I was in Hollywood this, this last week, and I met with one person who had sold that show to Hulu. Um, and the show didn't, it, got, it died in development. It's very sad. He's a brilliant writer. Um, and he was like, you know what? I actually think, I think I want to go back indie. I think that this is my strategy. I need to like start making stuff again on my own. And this was always part of the strategy, right? Use Hollywood and build this narrative of, I created this platform. I can actually create sustainable careers, which I did for like a moment, because there's no sustainability for people of color in capitalism. Um, but that would create the funding to solidify the platform so that afterwards, when Hollywood is over with, there would be this platform for us. And I was able to tell this writer last week, actually, we're starting a mini production fund next year. And you can apply to it because you are a past fellow of our organization. So I actually think the past is a guide to us. And if we think strategically as researchers, we can work in solidarity with communities, use our knowledge of the past to help prepare them for the present and the future in as much as we can, right? Like, it's still corporate capitalism. I have no savior mentality that I'm going to, like, save these people, right? Like, they're going to do what they're going to do. Capitalism is going to do what it's going to do. But we can help on the margins, right? And I think we can actually predict the future um, when we're really attendant to what we're reading in the research. Um, the next, you, you're, you're talking a lot about people who work within the system to create futures that work for them. Uh, that create moments of possibility. And Sylvia, you talked about points of inflection as well, where things don't go as you thought that they would. And, and yes, you predict a trajectory perhaps, but then within that trajectory, there's a moment of possibility, a moment for change. You kind of can think ahead and look at where those points of inflection might emerge. Um, you've talk, talked a lot about who is doing the making, who is doing the shaping. Sylvia, tell us a bit more about who you think shapes media futures at this point of inflection or when, when those points of inflection come? Well, the question is who, who, who believes that it can determine or shape the future? And that's what I'm saying, that it eventually gets much more complicated because especially given technological changes and interactivity and you know, information abundance, then it gets more, more messy, the, the, the multiple uses of that. Um, 
So the question is, how do we answer that question? Or, I mean, first of all, what questions are we asking? The second one is the way that we approach it. So, for example, is a better way of asking the question about media future is, you know, if we are concerned about what's wrong right now, how the forces that are responsible for what's wrong right now may continue to remain in power by taking advantage of the new wave of technological development. That is a more interesting way of thinking about sort of power and counter power rather than just focusing on the technology, mm. right? Whether or not what afflicts us now, what concerns us right, right now, is any way that this thing, whatever technology will be harnessed, it will be a way of addressing some of those problems or perhaps the deepening of the problems. And I hope that we have learned enough for the last 20 years of not asking the questions in that, in that way. Which is, it's not about, it's not about the technology, it's about, let's say, society or politics or sort of other questions and the way that, that you can, sort of systems of power can be perpetuated because of the ability to harness technology, media, for, for, for certain purposes. That is, that to me is sort of a more interesting way of sort of approaching that rather than just imagining the media futures. I mean, uh, especially when people live day by day and, you know, in the now, they don't have the luxury, what I was saying earlier, about imagining what, what the future will look like. And it's, for the most part, a very adaptive, reactive, and interesting things happen um, in, in that space, right? Um, and also because, again, taking a more of a global perspective, most technological or media development happens in very specific small places around the world what is a mix of technology and know-how and economics and, you know, and sort of the way that capitalism develops certain technologies. And so that we're talking about a very small number of sort of powerful actors that at least at the very beginning have the capacity to actually shape those futures, right? Mm -hmm. um, that would be sort of a way of, I think, answering that, that question. Mm. So we have this kind of contrast between institutions and people who kind of work within them to kind of push them a bit in different directions. Sonia, which side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> Very binary. <laughs> um, and, and never um, on the side of a binary. Um, I think, um, yeah. So, so, I, so I, I, I kind of, you know, I see resonances in my work of of, of what you're both saying, um, and particularly that idea of, you know, when when the windows open, when the moment is upon us, what can we do with that moment? And it takes a a kind of historical lens to identify when that is, um, and um, it takes, um, you know, all our kind of self um, reflexive kind of realism to be uh, circumspect about what we hope we might be able to do with that moment. Um, I guess I, in, in my work, I am um, trying to navigate a certain moment that I see a, a, an open window now, um, and um, it makes me, um, uh, doesn't make me very optimistic, but just to feel that there's something. Anyway, so the moment I can see happening right now is, um, and I, you know, I might trace it to something like um, Francis Haugen's kind of uh, statement that among many things going wrong in big tech, big tech knows it is damaging young people's mental health mm -hmm. and they kind of end. So there's been a lot of um, soul searching, a lot of reflection, also a lot of damage limitation, a lot of um, you know, not listening to um, those who, 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 who might have something to say about young people's mental health. But there is a window in which one can say, actually, the academy working away over here, nothing to do with those debates about regulation, has been working on young people's mental health and can say, here is some evidence and here are some concerns and here are the way in which people themselves um, or the young people themselves might want to make certain recommendations about how things could change. And so I guess, um, you know, I could, I could construe what I do in part as, as playing that bridging role. And yes, it's about um, harnessing the privileged position that I have um, because often the young people who are um, being damaged by the, or, or um, uh, struggling with the practices of big tech um, don't have that voice unless those of us with the privileged position kind of mediate but it is also about responding to that debate now and trying to walk 
quite a, a, a tight line between, um, you know, because there are so many voices. But I do think, you know, to cut a, a long story short, I do think that something is, is about to settle, whether it's with the passage or in this country of the online um, safety bill, and there are similar kind of legislation happening in many parts of the world, but it will, it will, it will reach some new accommodation in perhaps the next five or ten years. And then the spotlight will be elsewhere, and the moment might be elsewhere. And so, you know, absolutely, without being naively optimistic, I do think that this is a good moment to kind of mobilise around. Um, so what am I talking about in terms of institutions of power? I guess um, speaking to, you know, using the privilege of the academy to uh, get a, to be heard a little bit by government, by multi-stakeholder, uh, foreign, nationally, and internationally. Fantastic. Which takes us beautifully to our last question before we open the floor to questions. Um, you've all talked about scholarship in different ways and the role of scholarship. Silvio, you said, you know, we must focus on asking interesting questions, not predictable ones, not ones that just reproduce things. Um, uh, AJ, you've, you've talked about bridging and, and connecting and being useful, and Sonia, you've just kind of... Uh, talked about mediating and responding to particular moments. And I wonder whether uh, we could conclude this bit of the discussion with that question about, in this kind of very complex environment with its structures that we know about, with the agentic work that we know about, what are the openings for radical scholarship that we might uh, want to kind of promote or create to create some kinds of futures that we would like to see? Uh, AJ, let's move. <laughs> I was, I was like, don't come to me first. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's such an important question. It's something that I'm really meditating on in my book. And, you know, it, it's, radical is not a word I use in, in the book. Um, and I think some people view my work as radical, and others would view it as highly institutional, right? Like, if you were in black studies in the United States and you're an Afro-pessimist Afro and you look at what I've done, you're just like, that's just neoliberal garbage, right? Which I would find highly offensive to the many black people who have told their stories freely on my platform, um, our platform. Um, so, you know, I think radical is, is pushing ourselves, right? To do better, to go deeper, um, to be in deeper relation with the world around us. Um, and it's always going to be compromised because everything in this world is compromised in some way. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't start my work. I didn't plan to start a nonprofit. That's really what I'm saying, y'all. I didn't plan to start a nonprofit, but I ended up there, right? And there's nothing radical about a nonprofit in the United States, right? Um, but and yet, you know, the executive director Elijah McKinnon you know, runs that organization as radically as they can. You know, this is an organization that comes from my research that I did not get paid for or benefit financially from nearly at all, um, that provides unlimited vacation to its full-time staff of three black people, right? And, um, you know, they, their health benefits plan includes a subscription and membership to the local black feminist healing salon, right, where they can get crystals and tarot cards and acupuncture um, to do this healing work, right? Like having people who are marginalized tell their stories unabashedly without censorship to them is radical, right? Um, and very meaningful healing work. And so they also need to be healed. Um, they, we push back on our you know, majority white funders when they might try to pressure us on metrics and how do we do things, you know? And I think that maybe there's a little bit of that DNA of experimentation, that this thing started from this like anarchic queer space that helped create this kind of nonprofit that actually a lot of our funders are telling their other grantees, hey, you need to look at them and how they run their organization, right? Um, which is not, I mean, when you read the literature on nonprofit, especially nonprofits that serve and are by black Americans, you know, they, those are not stories of wellness in the workplace, right? People burn themselves out to serve their communities and it ends up creating this vicious cycle of harm, right? Um, for me, you know, that's like work I've done, it's gone. So when I think going forward, I've learned all of this stuff. I've learned where I've made my compromises. I learned where I compromised maybe on my politics. Um, and so I'm just gonna try and be more radical the next time. But I'm not gonna call it radical, right? It's really gonna be more, I'm just gonna question myself and make sure I'm not settling 
um, because I think for me, my research is really about that deep inquiry into who I am, how I'm impacting the environment, and how we can together create a better environment. And that's, that inquiry is not about finding solutions, right? It's not about proving things. It's not about results. It's really about the constant engaging of the process. Um, I, it struck me that you talked again about radical, but in context which takes us back to your point about the importance of context that mm. you mentioned at the beginning. So I don't know, if, how would you think about radical scholarship? Would you go back Well, to I mean, context? avoid the temptation of chasing after sort of the shiny objects. Uh, and I think that it's important to go back to what happened in academia, at least parts of academia or in our field, 15, 20 years ago, about the exuberant techno-optimism linked to some vision of radical politics that in some cases, sorry to say this, was almost indistinguishable from corporate copy about Twitter revolutions and all, you know, all that stuff. I think we need to learn that actually it is much more, it's always much more complicated than that. And for some reason, the more sort of nuanced, complicated process were like swept under sort of this uh, optimism that actually was not grounded in much evidence, was grounded in aspiration, which is, it's just fine, but I mean, uh, calling for more rigor and for sort of always finding out what are the blind spots. When you have a conversation about this, think about what is missing and why somebody who's dominating the conversation is forgetting about certain issues. That to me is sort of, um, that is a source of thinking about more radical alternatives to it. Um, because inevitably the questions that we've just mentioned tend to be inconveniently forgotten or there's no people with sort of a huge microphone dominating the conversation about, about this. So, I don't know, let's say 15 years ago we thought that sort of citizen journalism was going to revolutionize the way we think about it. Now we're thinking about uh, journalists and including citizen journalists being harassed constantly and there is no sort of viable, obvious way out of that. How did that happen? How did we miss that? How did we miss that actually power in different formation of power uh, actually is trying to exploit different media, different platforms to pursue interests that have very little to do with democracy, representation, diversity, inclusion. Um, how do we thought that this was to be again, as if we didn't learn from the past, that new technologies were going to be a plethora of information and alignment and knowledge. Now we are like obsessed running around, hey, this information is a problem. Hey, that was pretty predictable. It's not new. This information has a longer history than information, actually, whatever we understand by information. How do we forget these things? That, to me, it is what is still remarkable, that in some ways that is kind of, even though we should know better than everybody else, because this is what we do for a living, this is what we read, this is what we do research, this amnesia about not the same debates, but running after us if, you know, technology or media technology, whatever form, there will be the solution to, to the problems. How do we not predict that digital hate was going to be the thing that we're wrestling with and there's no sort of obvious solutions or ways to reduce that, to protect people, to empower people vis-a-vis -vis digital hate? Go back to the literature 20 years ago, it will be very difficult to find any of the problems that is you know, logically obsessing us right now Anyone who says, hey, wait a minute, why don't we learn from what we already produce, what our colleagues have written about, that it's likely to be more complex and not to be too pessimistic about it, you know, maybe it's going to get worse or really bad. And suddenly say, oh, you know, we just, we just missed the boat. We could not say that. That is the kind of, I mean, if you want it more like uh, if you're going back and doing a little bit more of a sociology of, uh, of knowledge, how do we miss certain things? And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not exaggerating or offering a caricature of this. But if you look back at the debate, what the debate was, it was very optimistic, very, you know, sort of uh, the idea that we can do it kind of thing, forgetting that it's always much more complicated. Than mm -hmm. that. Those questions about, you know, what's missing, what have I forgotten, what have I, what have I forgotten that I read 20 years ago, they are, as I guess, for, academy, for, for academics, those questions that stop you being settled. What am I missing? What, what's not there? What have I forgotten? Or well, what could we read even from, like, you know, 40 years ago or 100 years ago? Right. So, you know, read something with a 19 in front of the um, <laughs> citation. <laughs>
at 18. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, one way we could take um, your provocation, Sylvia, would be um, to, res to respond respond with an internal analysis. What is wrong with the academy that it is so obsessed with presentism, that we don't recall our own history, um, that we don't, we in this, uh, we have to stop saying we, but we in this um, field of media and communications, which is itself very new, don't learn from the longer legacy of political science, of sociology, of history, of economics, you know, there's, there's many ways of looking back and we, we don't do it. Why? Because we are making the case for something new, because we are always following uh, the latest innovation, because that's our kind of rationale, that's how we build our case to get funding, with our funding bids, so that's how we begin the abstract of every article we submit to, to journals, you know, something new has happened here, <laughs> and um, that's why this, this merits being published, not let me write an article about how the same old thing is happening yet again. So, so you know, and, and, and those are the pressures on us. So, you know, that's, but I, I think, um, so, you know, um, Mayor Culper, we should all do our best also to critique our um, internal academic um, processes and especially for a relatively new field we have that chance to um, make the field um, differently. Actually, um, thinking of your um, original question, uh, Lee, about radical scholarship, which we're all avoiding, um, <laughs> and I shall too, um, um, I've been reflecting on this conference and hearing um, a very wide range of ambitions some of which are for radical scholarship and some of which are for um, making a modest contribution to a particular strand in existing scholarship or reminding us of the diversity of the field and the ways in which we um, contribute, sometimes contributing um, beyond media and communications but taking something we know to other fields and working in kind of interdisciplinary ways. So I actually think you know that there, there are lots of efforts um, going on here to make contributions in, in lots of different ways. And radical, you know, one definition of radical might be it is against whatever is dominant, the dominant norm. And I think that is how we train our students and that is how we um, talk to each other, which is always to ask, you know, you can rely on people in this room to ask, ask you the hard questions. And even if they're too polite to say it, you kind of... No, um, uh, it's there as a possibility. So I think, you know, we, we, we do that. Maybe I'm, you know, too much of a rationalist, but I do believe that we, um, we do our best to support a diversity of directions of research and enormous diversity of, of forms of engagement also, I think I've heard over the last um, few days. You know, some setting up a new non-profit or um, engaging with government or um, working in various civil society organizations or working with established media organizations you know there's a lot of very diverse kinds of efforts but if in each of those we are saying you take this for granted but i have some of different evidence or you take this for granted but have you thought about who is left out and here is the problem with your Proposal. You know, if we're always asking the critical questions, I mean, I guess yeah. maybe that's that's the best I think we can be doing. Yeah, I think I mean that is that is critical. I mean, and I want to really sort of emphasize the notion of sort of critical thinking when we talk about radical scholarship and being anti-dogmatic, interrogate even our own assumptions yeah. constantly. I mean, we have this tremendous privilege and of mm. opportunity to actually do that work, which is very difficult elsewhere in societies, no matter what the conditions mm -hmm. are, to actually do that, especially when it comes to questions about media futures, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is a lot of power, a lot of money at stake in actually trying to persuade societies about, yes, all the stuff will do great things for, for society, right? So, and I think that that is something to remind ourselves all the time, to produce the evidence that sustain a critical position about this matter. So, um, I, I will say that. I mean, what the actual political horizon looks like, I mean, that is like, you know, a related but a separate discussion. But as, a, as an intellectual disposition, as an attitude, to me, that is, that is fundamental rather than embarking on, on, on a kind of thinking 
um, that actually forgets some of the good things that we actually do, we actually pursue, that actually probably mo motivated many of us to be in academia, right? To have that kind of sort of, you know, skeptical, critical perspective. Thank you all for your responses to those questions. Let's turn to the audience. Uh, we have about, ooh, lots, lots of hands have gone up. Um, about 20 minutes for questions, something like that. So I can see the young lady in the front, uh, the gentleman behind her. Let me go to the back as well. Uh, there's a gentleman at the back, top left, and maybe, let's take those three and then we'll come to this side. Um, what I suggest is that we take three at a time don't feel you all have to respond to all three questions. It would be nice to gather in quite a few mm -hmm. questions if we can, um, given that it's the end of the conference. So, uh, go ahead. Um, thank you so much uh, for um, this very interesting talk. So, um, I think one of the common strands that um, all of you discussed was this, you know, interconnections between past, future, and the people's idea of technology and if you look in the past there has been a trend of you know society always overestimating what might happen in future like for example in 1990s or 1980s people would think that there would be you know flying cars or some very grand technology in future but that often fails and I think one of the reasons for that failure might be the ideologies behind the people who are making these technologies. They are always, you know, coming from these elite perspectives which might create technologies that are, you know, discriminatory against social identities in some forms. And I think that might be happening right now with AI technologies, you know, there are instances of it being discriminatory against people of different races, of different identities. And so I would just like to ask, you know, what kind of future do you see in academic research specifically about this overestimation of, you know, technologies and how it always sort of tends to get a bit distracted from its, you know, purpose and goes back to the existing ideologies of, you know, not it being that potential as we thought of it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vincent. Um, the point Emma made about you know the, the window being open right now, and then Sonia said you know something about to set to, and it reminds me of the of, of the online safety bill and um, in, you know, taking this regulation now, and how, um, for instance, I'm reminded of the way the UK government, for instance, says you know the, the bill is like a world leading, has to be world leading and world be, world beating. So this kind of a competitive language to it, you know, like a competition between maybe the UK and Europe and the US, and so and so. We look at AI regulation, for instance. There's, there's a similar pattern. So there's like this competitive or countries of the world, all trying to come up with like competitive regulatory policies. So, um, so, so I'm thinking, as we as media researchers, how do you, how do we um, address or re respond to this kind of a competitive atmosphere, or do we even need to challenge some of these things? Yeah. Thank you. And then the third question was at the back. Okay, well, greetings. I'm Carrington Wiggum. I'm getting my master's here at LSE currently. But I do have a question for AJ, so when you get a chance, I know we're round robbing. Um, but because your work is social and political, um, it engages with that type of impact through entertainment media, I do have a question that fosters a bit of an obvious answer, but because my generation is, has that entrepreneurial spirit, we have to get used to having hearing no's, receiving no's, moving on with it. But I want to know that do you ever feel overlooked by the people you intentionally try to impact? And how do you, you know, overcome that? And what does that look like for the future of your company and companies who have similar um, ambitions to do the work that you do? Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go with those three. So, um Dealing with the overestimation of technology, challenging the competitive atmosphere, and then what happens when you're kind of not over, when you're overlooked? Uh, who would like to start? Shall I um, yes. kick off? Um, so uh, I was actually at a, a, a there was a very interesting um, panel earlier about um, whether we should be cynical or optimistic about um, participatory approaches and co-design. This is to your um, to your question, 
Um, I guess, um, yes, so future imaginaries um, largely stem from the elites and they are, you know, imagining the, the, the future in their own interests um, rather than those of others. Um, so again, maybe a window, maybe a trend, but at the moment there is a lot of talk about um, uh, participatory research, co-design, co-development. Um, I don't know, um, you know, if that is going to be, it's not going to be sufficient to overcome, but it is... You can see the way in which some certain kinds of structural changes are being built into um, very top-down organizations. Um, the European Commission, um, the Internet Governance Forum, um, various UN bodies are kind of, you know, now have that kind of little, almost a risk assessment tag that says, and have we consulted the people who are actually going to be affected? Have we made sure we've heard the voices of those who... Um, who will be the potential beneficiaries or the actual people on the ground using this tech. So, um, you know, again, not to be um, uh, naively optimistic, but I think it's, it's actually some of those structural changes that say you, you, you can't have a decision-making um, forum without making sure there's been that moment. Yes, it becomes the usual suspects. Yes, it becomes a tick box exercise. Yes, people hire the consultants who can do, you know, co-design on fish this week and, you know, children next week and, um, you know, AI the following week. Um, there's a lot of problems, but still those, you know, those are, if you like, the kind of the, the, the fractures in the system where we can lobby and we can, and we can um, push. And um, just to link that to um, Vincent's point, I think that is happening a little bit with the online safety bill. Um, and... Um, uh, of course, the rhetoric about Britain being world leading and best is just, you know, totally reprehensible. Um, and we should um, uh, combat it where we can because it's kind of bizarre imperialist discourse that the government keeps um, promoting. But I don't think it has any real significance in the shaping of the bill, which actually is, seems to me a much more old fashioned struggle between. Um, government objectives, civil society voices, and vastly outweighing them all, um, industry and commercial interests. I love the idea of co-designed fish. Uh, <laughs> over to you, Sylvia. Um, well, I will say that I think the question, and, and in many panels we heard this for the last two days, that I think that we typically, the, the binary between optimism and pessimism probably is not the right way because it seems to me that we can find examples to be optimistic or pessimistic, as we could find in the last 20 years, examples about media sort of uh, developments or new media developments to be optimistic and pessimistic. So the question, the, the, the question is not that one. The question to me is what is the dimension, what is the relevance of whatever we find because there are so many interesting and dynamic things, and sort of for me, the last two days an experience of all kinds of things that I didn't know, and I and I learned, and you can say you can draw all kinds of conclusions. So then the question is, uh, what is the relevance of the dimension of any particular example, case study that we are studying, uh, for the bigger questions, for the more theoretical questions, and that is what we need to. We, we should not lose sight of of that. Otherwise, we're just focused on something that in some ways we turn that as if they were sort of representative or symptomatic of something um, bigger. And that's always very, 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 very difficult, right? Um, so that to me is a way of addressing at, at least, I think, that the first two questions in ways of avoiding the typical sort of ways that we approach this in a normative or moral sort of uh, way of, you know, what drives our research, why, why we're studying this. Um, yes, to answer maybe, or to just an answer to two, one, if you were asking about sort of the competitive nature of regulation, like is the EU ahead of, or the UK ahead of the EU, ahead of the US in terms of regulating this new technology, from the US perspective, um, I don't think the U.S. is even trying to compete, really. Um, so I feel like it's maybe, the competition is maybe good. Like you hear these industry folks being like, "Oh, the EU is regulating blockchain or AI. Like we should get on that." Like I, I want regulation. I mean, it's always flawed, but it's better than nothing. Maybe most of the time. Um, that's my answer to that. And then for your answer, for your question, thank you for spot for pointing out the no's come both from the industry, like. 
If you go to Hollywood, you want to pitch something, you're going to hear no about a thousand times. If you get a yes, it'll probably eventually turn to a no. But you're right that also your community says no to you, right? Like, we're doing okay with subscriptions with OTV, but it's kind of amazing how hard it is to get people, queer people of color, to support queer people of color, right? Like, we spent all of our money giving these corporations, and we don't say yes to our own people, you know? It's like the ways in which the colonial mind kind of, like, infiltrates our own mind. So, you know, you already know the answer. You just got to keep going, right? Like, that's what our ancestors did. That's what we have to do. Um, and you have to hope that by doing your work as best you can, you bring the yeses to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to, there was a, a question here at the front and then one just at the back on the left and then one in the middle there and then I will come to that side. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katalin Fahir from Hungary, University of Public Service and um, if I may, I want to start with a, a story from the morning session. Uh, I presented about uh, AI-driven media and uh, I asked the people in the room maybe they want to meet with a robot dog or not. And almost anybody, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, almost uh, nobody wanted to meet with a robot dog. That was quite shock for me. And after that, during the coffee break and so on, I had a conversation with people and the par participants of the conference uh, mentioned they are scary because the STEM studies are in the forefront so maths, engineering, and so on, and social science and humanities starting to be in the background. So these are very uh, connected topics. The third one happened here during the plenary session, and you mentioned the big tech all the time, something else, which is independent from the research. And yes, we know they are taking the talented postdocs for higher salary for Facebook AI or something. So I'm just curious, where will be in the future the media studies, media and communication studies? What do you think? Do we need to keep distance, like from the robot dogs? Do we need to fight for grants, for scholarships, uh, if we are in the big competition with STEM studies? And uh, maybe we need to be the part of coding or codes. Uh, instead of talking about narratives, because codes are building a new and uh, structurally changing world. This is my observation during the two days of the conference, and thank you for your fantastic panel, and I'm really curious what is your answer for my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to the back. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to a point that Silvio was talking, which are the futures that did not happen. So I wonder if any of you could recall other futures that did not happen in media and communications, and if there is anything that we can learn within or beyond academia about the fact that these futures did not occur in the end. Thank you, Vicky. That's my question, and uh, there's one in the middle at the front here, just down here. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, sorry a gentleman with a pink shirt. Uh, thank you very much, Paul Frosch from the Hebrew University. Um, really fascinating panel. Um, is there any room in the future of media and communication studies for an old-fashioned, ivory, slightly ivory tower approach, which stipulates that it is worth researching and investigating communication simply because it is a core practice of human life, irrespective of whether that then has predictable social impact or outcomes? Great question. Thank you very much. Okay, so we so we have um, uh, should we remain independent of big tech given the challenges that we have as a disciplinary area, or should we uh, look for grants, um, futures that didn't happen? Can we learn from them? And uh, should we go back to the ivory tower? Just to paraphrase <laughs> all there. Um, <laughs> I'll start. Um, I actually want to answer all three really quickly if I can. So uh, yes, absolutely. I mean. I feel like I read old-fashioned communication research, and it's been enormously informational, inspirational to me as I do try to do impactful, presentist, trendy work, right? Um, so let's do all the things. Um, futures that didn't happen, I would say, I think 
primarily of two things for me. One, the way that HIV decimated a generation of queer people so that people my age did not have mentors when we entered media, academia, the arts, et cetera. That's a future that didn't happen that I greatly wish had. Um, and also Soul. There's a documentary on Max called Mr. Soul, if you have it here. I don't know, you know the licensing stuff, but um, it's the first black TV show, 1968 to 1973. President Nixon killed it because he didn't like it. Um, and it was a brilliant television show that I think actually would have completely changed our culture had it lasted as long as it should have. It was enormously popular on public television. Just watch the documentary and you'll see what I'm talking about. And then for STEM, you know, I don't know how to exactly answer your question, but I think about all this conversation around AI and how the uh, coders, the computer programmers, are worried because they have trained AI to code. And so they have trained their replacement <laughs> in STEM, right? So like, AI is really good at the STEM stuff. It's actually not so good at the human art creative stuff, right, that we do. So let's do the narratives. I think we are the future. <laughs> Would you like to respond, or both? Um, OK, I can um, go next. I also want to answer all three questions, um, if you'll bear with me. Um, uh, so uh, futures that didn't um, happen, uh, Cesar. Um, so before the pandemic, I was being told the whole time, um, kids are just staring at their screen. They want to stare at their screen. They don't care about human contact. They'll forget how to make eye contact. They're just completely absorbed in that world. When the pandemic happened, and many terrible things resulted <laughs> happened during the pandemic, but one of the upsides was we discovered, actually kids, all of us, are quite keen on face-to-face, um, -face, in person, human, direct contact. And we've all gone around like prodding you, just, I won't prod you, but we know, <laughs> you know what I mean, like you're real. Um, <laughs> And um, I won't say that just that future has gone away, but because it remains a kind of um, a, a, a fear thing. But um, I think, yeah. So that's a good a good future that um, was in the in the fantasies of many people and didn't happen. Um, so I'll, answer, I'll I'll just say something about the other two questions um, together. I I, I recently, um, for reasons I now can't remember, got embroiled in a debate in the world of um, mental health and digital health about um, whether it was okay to take funding from big tech and how um, mental health practice and research should um, progress. And I hazarded the view that anyone uh, researching on the question of whether big tech damages or is implicated in young people's health, um, uh, you should not take any money from big tech. And then the mental health practitioner, I don't know if there's some here, and researchers came back and said, Sonia, that ship has absolutely sailed. I mean, they're all taking money from, because they are developing the CBT app or the um, online um, health, uh, health solution, solution um, online, or because how else are, you know, that's, that's one line of argument. The other is, how are we going to know what is happening with people's minds in digital um, environments if we don't collaborate to get the data, if we don't co-design the research. So actually it's happening. So the only thing I could say as the end is, please let's have some people sitting in the ivory tower critiquing all of that work from the position of complete, scrupulous, beautiful independence. But also, more practically, my, my answer to that world was, we have to have some rules for engagement. And isn't it, um, if we're going to work with STEM, but if we're also going to work with the, the, the um, big tech and take, take the money, which you know people here will all have made different decisions, but where is the space where we debate it? Um, this institution does not give me any advice on, you know, beyond the most basic conflict of interest, do the journals advise us on anything beyond tick, conflict, of whatever. Um, so I think we're going to need to debate, um, you know, uh, and have some principles for, for the rules of engagement there. Thank you. Sylvia, would you like to uh, On that point, I thoroughly second what Sonia just said about the ethics of, you know, research ethics of working with big tech, and I think that is all over the map and different explanations. Again, this is not new. We talk about quote unquote older media. I mean, there were similar questions about whether or not to collaborate or working with governments on around 
prior of mediation, media policy. So it's not a cop-out, but I mean, you know, it is all over the map, and the question is that it's very difficult, it seems to me, to have, especially if you think about the global level, sort of guidelines or, you know, recommendations about what is the quote-unquote, I mean, it's not, it's not the ethical thing to do, but whose ethics are benefited by the choices that we make? I think that's a better way of asking the question about research <coughs> ethics. Um, on the features that didn't happen, to me, that is something that is always that it's such a rich area for us to basically uh, educate ourselves, primarily, and others about what actually happened. Because if you go back in you know, history, I mean, the example, I mean, back to Cesar's question, I teach, I don't know why I continue to teach that, but modernization theory was like totally la la land. I mean, it's just like bad everything. I mean, in, some, in so many different ways in which thinking about me in the 1950s and 1960s, how we're going to revolutionize the world, almost literally. Um, so, but it's not just really for historical curiosity, but basically what was the underlying premises of that kind of approach, the modernization approach, that misses so much, even though it has like incredible conditions in terms of resources and access to actually understand much better the relationship between what used to be called, in, you know, 70 years ago, uh, development and and and, and media. Um, under the question of the ivory tower, uh, I think this is again, I mean, that is what one of the points of you know that we are debating: are we exactly doing that? And again, there is no single path in which we choose to actually be academics. Uh, whether or not somebody feels, but this, what, this book that we'll publish later this year about public scholarship and communication studies, you know, surging interest, not just in the US, but around the world, of actually redefining what is the purpose of what we, of what we do without sort of, quote unquote, sacrificing the notion of ivory tower, but actually expanding, broadening the notion of what academic is for. What, what is the purpose of what we produce? <coughs> is that dominant, hegemonic? Probably not. So again, the question is how we diversify the way that we understand what is the purpose of what we are doing, trying to be much more um, inclusive and recognize different ways that we define what academic work, what, what, what scholarship is. Um, and to me, I'm finally, is this sort of avoid about basically what I, what I mentioned at the very beginning, the, you know, futurism. Futurism is exciting, right? But it's like, it's like a rocking chair. It keeps you entertained. It doesn't take you anywhere because you don't, <laughs> I mean, so what? I mean, you know, if you want to write science fiction, that, that's great. But I mean, to do what we do just to engage on, on <coughs> futurism, it's not that, that interesting. I mean, uh, um, anyway. Um, I'm just going to check with the organizers. Can we squeeze in two more questions? Is it, is it, no? <laughs> no? <laughs> the, the, the organizers are gone. <laughs> we own the place now. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go for two more questions because I did say I would go to this side and I haven't yet. There's a, a young woman with a kind of wavy hair just next to you. And then is there another one on that side or not? Okay, let's just stick with the, that last question then. And then you've got about 30 seconds to answer each of you. Okay? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Panagiotta Chachu from University of Leicester. Thank you so much for this fascinating discussion. Uh, I've tried to merge two questions in one. Hopefully it will make sense. So uh, drawing from uh, Sonia's reference to parents and how they feel isolated and lack support with respect to how they prepare the children for the future, for the media future, I wonder whether uh, the two distinct areas of work, on the one hand, the research and public interest work um, of the kind of uh, children's rights framework, and on the other hand, regulatory work of the kind of online sa safety bill, actually envision, uh, have the same vision for, uh, um, for online media uh, uh, and the users. Uh, and why these two separate areas of work, research, public interest work on one hand, and regulatory work on the other hand, actually aim to the same extent, with the same passion, to support parents and their families and prepare them for this online media future and what's going to look like for the, uh, for the future generations? Thank you. 30 seconds. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so in, in, in my experience, I might be wrong, other experts here, um, those proposing regulatory solutions or um, rights-based solutions don't have very developed and practical ideas about what the future would look like. They have a, an analysis of the problems now. They have a kind of a quite high level vision of, of, of how a world without those problems, but what it would really be, I mean, for example, um, uh, there's very little thought that I see in the policy world about anticipating the, anticip the unanticipated consequences. We know from history that every intervention has unanticipated consequences, but I don't really see that getting played. Sometimes it does. Some organizations are, are better than others, but they, you know, and do they consult us, the social scientists, who might know something about what would drive those unanticipated consequences? Um, not, not enough. So, um, I, I think uh, so. Panagati, you've asked a, a question that that I could say many things about, and and, and I won't. But um, uh, I will just maybe I'll just say at the end uh, one one reason I research children is because I think they're a really interesting and neglected topic. But another is because I think that they stand for many vulnerable and marginalised groups in different, which are all different and in different ways. But they just provide a lens on the dominant trends and the main regulatory and kind of policy debates from an outsider perspective in a way that reveals some new possible directions. I think new possible directions is a fantastic uh, idea to uh, finish on. Um, please do join me in thanking the panel, but don't go yet because there's one more thing that we have to do. Thank you very much all of you for being so generous.